John and Aaron both work across at uh, NASA Ames now. John comes to us from the uh, University of North Dakota and, and Aaron from the University of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, they've been working together with David Loftus on this work and uh, a very topical subject uh, given uh, the desire of the US to return to the uh, lunar surface for good uh, in the next decade. So they're going to talk to us today about some of the talks points for effects of dust. Thanks, Adrian. So we'd like to invite you to participate in this. We're thinking of it as a conversation. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. We're, we're, we're going to provide you a little bit of information about the project in general, what it is that we've been doing, the approaches that we're taking, talk about a little bit about some of the assays, show you some results, and also weave into it a little bit about the history of the topic in general, because as we're finding, uh, the information that we learn from the Apollo astronauts is becoming more and more important in the development of the experiments as well as the operational scenarios that we expect to uh, take into consideration for the return of the human, human presence on the moon, as we, uh, Adrian has discussed. So th the first thing that I want to point out is what's the big deal about the dust? And the way I wanted to show you this is just by looking at a quick video of one of the Apollo astronauts on Apollo 17 moving through, this is a pixelated image, but I'd like to draw your attention to the dust that he's kicking up around his feet. And take a look at uh, how dirty his suit has become and how easily this material is spread around uh, as the individual <laughs> is moving on the surface. And, and you can see these large sprays of dust uh, as just very simple motions of the astronaut impart accelerations to the particles and so on. So the question is, how does all that material that he's kicking up affect the astronauts? Uh, and what is it that we can do to try to quantify it in a scientific perspective? So what we're doing is turning to some of the old hardware that has been used um, by previous missions. And an example that we'll pull up here first is Jack Schmidt's lunar spacesuit. In careful examination, uh, you can obviously see that the thing is covered in dust and it has experienced a fair amount of damage. Aaron has actually gone back to the Smithsonian and done some sampling of these suits to try to get an understanding of the distribution of particles inside the suits as well. The reason we focus on Jack Schmidt's spacesuit is because it's one of the few that was not dry cleaned. So the other ones aren't quite so useful to us these days due to the dry cleaning residue on them. So as we mentioned before, uh, the information that we learn from the astronauts is critical in trying to understand what it is we need to be studying about the characteristics of the dust. For example, the, the messages that Pete Conrad and others like Gene Cernan, as we'll talk about in a moment, has said, are very clear that the dust has had a significant effect on the suits. And in this quote, I'd like to read it to you, it has a very important point to it. We must have had more than 100 hours of suited work with the same equipment, and the wear was not so bad on the training suits as it is on these flight suits. In just eight hours, we were out. I think it is because of the abrasiveness of the dust. What we found out is that the suits were rendered nearly useless after those brief exposures to the lunar environment. And Gene Cernan, in this very classic picture of being covered by lunar dust inside the spacecraft on the lunar surface, says, I think that dust is probably one of our greatest inhibitors to a nominal operation on the moon. And I think we can overcome other physiological or physical or mechanical problems except the dust. And the parallel that we like to draw here is one that can be compared to other industrial environments that may be uh, be potentially hazardous. And the example that we like to compare to is with silica mining or coal mining. In the past, there have been documented examples of how mining events uh, in a variety of uh, locations in, in silica-rich mines have produced uh, problems in the workers that have mined the silica, as well as large numbers of deaths as a result of inhalation of freshly ground silica that has been uh, inhaled by each of the workers. And as Aaron will point out later, that 
the dust itself is very much silica rich. Sorry about the change. So let me introduce you to the culprit. Here is a grain of lunar dust. And this is, in essence, what we're interested in. Um, the dust is like nothing we find on Earth. And that's what makes it so very interesting to study. So what is it made of? Well, here we have five samples documented from four different Apollo sites. So two from Apollo 11, one from Apollo 17, 16, and 14. And so just to remind you where those sites are, here we have the lunar surface. I'm sure you remember the six Apollo landings highlighted in the black circles. Each of these missions brought back samples, so we're able to analyze them. And just for your information, something you may not be aware of, there are also three Russian missions that brought back samples as well. So we have in total nine separate sites where lunar dust was collected from. Predominantly, the samples we work with are Apollo because the Russian missions only brought back 300 grams. But there is the existing Russian missions to look at. So these are the four sites that we're going to talk about, these, the, the grains that we have the compositional details for. And the component that is the most prevalent is silica. Now, this is essentially just glass, silica dioxide. Um, it's also, as John just alluded to, heavily mined. And it's very dangerous in the mining industry. And so this is particularly interesting for us. And we'll come back to, us to this. We also have um, aluminum, which is about 12%. It varies across the, the sampling sites, but it is about 12% in the dust. We have iron oxide, which is essentially rust. And that's about 13 14%. But something that's very interesting is that we have something called nanophase iron, which is a form of fully reduced iron, a form of iron that we don't find on Earth unless we look at very specific small-scale chemical uh, plants. And I'll come back to that in just a second. And the last one that's rather interesting is calcium oxide. So to come back to the iron, why are we interested in this? Well. The way that lunar dust is formed adds uh, iron to it. It also adds some very interesting surface features to it. So the way that the dust is formed is you have micrometeorites coming in, smashing into the lunar surface at high velocities. When they hit the surface, you have high temperatures, which causes the vaporization of that silica dioxide. That silica dioxide forms a cloud in the general vicinity, which very quickly recondenses. Some of the components of these micrometeorites are are vaporized at the same time. So they end up in these condensations. And so that is the source of these nanophase iron particles that coat the surface of the lunar dust trapped within the silica uh, condensation regions. And we don't know what this is going to do. We don't have anything like it on Earth. We don't have any experience with it. And it is one of the areas where we have a lot of questions about toxicity. There's also the reactive surface of the dust. So I've introduced that in part. We've talked about the micrometeorite impacts, which vaporize the dust. You get the, the impact-derived material embedded, causing the nanophase iron. But you have a fourth variable here, the solar wind implantation. And so we have now a, f a form of, of mineral that is known in some cases to be toxic on Earth, that has a form of iron that we don't have much experience with that is coated with a reactive surface. And they're all a bunch of very strange shapes. And so here we have images of lunar dust. These images um, were shared with us from, by Dr. Larry Taylor and Dr. David McKay, two of our colleagues that we're working on these projects with. And these particles are like nothing we find here. They're sharp. They're jagged because they're not weathered by the terrestrial weathering patterns that we're familiar with here on Earth. The air pollution particles that we're breathing in due to our lovely forest fire are very, very different appearing than this. These are fairly large, but you want to know about these ones, the respirable lunar dust. Thank you for that. These guys all can be breathed into the deep regions of the lungs. These ones are the ones that we're worried about for pulmonary toxicity. So when you think of a size of a grain of dust, what you want to think of is that the very small stuff can get into the lungs. It also is very interesting or important how much of a reactive surface area it has. And that is partially dictated by the shape. 
So the dust is small, it gets in, it has a convoluted shape which gives it a huge surface area. Look at how much surface area these particles here would have. And when you put this together with just pulmonary uh, physiology, the particles that are smaller than 10 microns get into the upper airways in this region. The particles that are 2.5 to 0.1 microns are able to be breathed deep into the lungs, into the alveolar regions where gas exchange occurs in the lungs. And the ones that are really small, these guys are thought to actually not only get into the lungs, but potentially into the cardiovascular system and be transported throughout the body. So we, in terms of the, the toxicity, are looking at the three micron and smaller, the ones that can get into the deep regions of the lungs. So then what does the lunar dust look like? How much of this fraction is in that size range? Well, this is a sample from Apollo 11. And if you want later, I can explain to you how I know that from this bizarre numbering scheme. Um, and if you look over here, what you can see is that about 4% by weight is in that small range. To compare that to another sample from Apollo 16, you see that in that same size range, you actually have a higher percentage perhaps, but not, not too much, maybe about 7 or 8%. So there is a bit of variability in how much is respirable, but it's a significant amount that could very easily cause uh, health concerns. And so to summarize the size distribution, because this is very important for toxicity, we know that it's a heterogeneous mixture of particle sizes. There's big stuff and little stuff. Approximately 20% of lunar regolith is smaller than 20 microns, which is what you can breathe in. And about 5% is in the sub-5 micron range, which is what can get into the lungs. Now, I know I've used the 3 micron and the 5 micron. I only had 5 micron data, but we're probably going to guess that it's probably about 3% is the stuff that will get into the deep regions of the lungs and may cause significant problems for uh, inhalation toxicity. So number, number? Number. That's an excellent question, actually. I think it's by number. So how is NASA approaching the problem to address the toxicity of lunar dust? NASA has formed an organization called LADTEG, which is the Lunar Airborne Dust Toxicity Advisory Group. It's a strongly interdisciplinary group of scientists, engineers, uh, physicians, biologists, flight surgeons, astronauts, chemists, and a variety of other folks who are organizing a uh, work effort to try to come up with a permissible exposure limit for astronauts to lunar dust. And the work is now charged to be completed by 2010 to come up with that number. So we have uh, the charge now to deliver that number to the Office of the Chief Health and Medical Officer, otherwise known as OCHMO. And the work is being led out of Johnson Space Center as well as Ames. And we've partnered with a variety of external partners at other universities as well to help perform some of the work. This chart summarizes NASA Ames' role in the biological studies. However, note that there is similar charts for geologic studies, chemical reactivity studies uh, as well. Ames and Johnson are partnering together to do work that are complementary to one another. Ames' roles focus on three central questions that have to do with skin studies, ocular studies, and cellular studies that are going to address the pulmonary toxicity of the lunar dust. This work will be in cooperation with Chu Wing Lam and other uh, partners at Johnson Space Center to come up with that permissible exposure limit. The first area that I'm going to talk about uh, in this section of slides are the skin studies. In particular, there are three areas that we're interested in with regard to skin, as Aaron has mentioned previously. We're interested in the immune system sensitization effects, that is, uh, is there an allergic response to the dust? Are there other irritant effects? And what are the abrasion characteristics of the dust itself? So to consider this, we need to consider the things that Aaron has said previously. Let me remind you that dust is composed of sharp, jagged material that has been formed through the constant environment of the lunar surface. The question that we're interested in asking is, what happens if dust gets into the spacesuit? Could you perhaps 
cause some type of wounding of the skin, some abrasion of the skin. Uh, the questions then lead to what happens in terms of loss of fluids? Is there an increased risk of infection? And how does this affect the spacesuit itself? So we turn to terrestrial examples of skin abrasion to help to start to answer these questions and address them. We know that prolonged soil contact uh, here on Earth can produce local irritation and trauma, dermatitis, breakdown of the epidermis itself, potentially causing tissue infections as, as well as local allergic reactions. So as we would mentioned before, we're curious about what the impact skin abrasion will have on lunar missions. And so what we're doing is using samples like this one, which is a lunar simulant, to begin work uh, with skin abrasion studies to perfect the techniques so that we can then go to the curation facilities, get real lunar dust, and do the same studies of abrasion with real lunar dust. And the example of, uh, of real lunar dust from Apollo 11 here is in Aaron's hands. We're working with the uh, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, who is doing a lot of work. Uh, Steve Jacques' lab, he's an expert in skin abrasion and dermatology. And we have some preliminary results uh, that we'd like to talk to you about. Excuse me, can you say a little more about the simulated dust? Does it simulate the relevant parameters for what you're doing? The, the, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, the, the short answer is that it can, it can simulate most of the uh, characteristics of lunar dust, but certainly not all of them. We can is it small, sharp grains? It's small, sharp grains, uh, but it doesn't have the chemical reactivity of real lunar dust. And it's, it is, uh, the exact mineral composition is going to depend upon uh, which sample you're going to be uh, working with. And but it's it lacks the nanophase iron. And it lacks the nanophase iron. We're working to try our so colleagues. These are pictures of them, maybe like the pictures you show. No. Not exactly. There's no, it, currently we don't know how to make those. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we had some thoughts about using the vertical gun range at Ames to try and simulate micrometeorite bombardment, but th there's been, that hasn't come to fruition at this point. And that in and of itself is a huge concern, that shape. We can get the size particles matched, but we can't get the shape. So how are we doing the studies with uh, Oregon Health and Science University? What we're using is pig skin as a model to uh, uh, test the abrasive qualities of lunar simulant as well as lunar dust. The method that we use or the approach that we're using is coming, uh, using a small sample of cotton fabric, for example, embedding into the cotton fabric samples of real lunar dust in this example, and then rubbing the skin uh, with a known number of strokes with a known amount of pressure to abrade the skin simulating what would happen if a, a spacesuit was abrading against the skin itself. Ja uh, Steve Jacques' lab has developed a very unique system that's very simple, that's able to measure the conductivity of the skin itself before and after abrasion. And what we see is that after abrasion, when we measure the conductivity, the impedance in that location drops, the current is able to flow better, and so you're able to measure the damage of the, the external layer of the skin uh, as a result of the abrasion. So, just out of interest, I noticed this, that you might be interested to look at. It's small, but in this image here, this is actually an area that we've done abrasion work on. So, you can see the two little divots where the, the probe was pushed in. We're not talking about a lot of abrasion. We're talking about 10 strokes. So, it's not as if you are shredding the skin. And yet, even with very small 10 strokes applied uh, in a very simple way, we see some very interesting changes. So the first thing that we've observed is that coarse dust is more abrasive. The results we're going to show you today are all done with the JSC 1A simulant. We have preliminary work with the lunar dust, but we're going to hold off drawing conclusions on that till we have an N that's higher than 1. So along this side, we have electrical resistance. And as John said, when the electrical resistance drops, that's indi indicative of damage occurring to the skin. Along the bottom, we have how much JSC was added to that cotton patch. And so what I'd like you to see is that the coarse dust, which is in blue, it drops off here at 30 milligrams, where the very fine dust, which is much smaller, 
makes it all the way to 500 milligrams before you see the same level of abrasion occurring. So the bigger particles are definitely more damaging. And I'm sure you can all relate to this rock in your shoe. Which one do you notice first, the big one or the little one? Same idea. The other thing we've been looking at is fabric materials. So the astronauts are wearing a spacesuit. What is against their skin? And what is against their skin? Will that help dictate the level of abrasion that is occurring? The answer is yes. So again, resistance along this axis, amount of JSC1A lunar simulant loaded along the bottom here. And what you can see is that red, which is the cotton, drops off at 65 milligrams of dust. So you need much more dust than the blue line. Now what is the blue line? Well, this is the current shirt that the astronauts wear under their EVA suits. They're not supposed to wear this shirt, but they do nonetheless. So we're using, uh, essentially it's a dry fit, running type shirt that many athletes tend to wear quite frequently. And using that fabric, put on the right way, at 30 milligrams of dust, you say, see the same as 65 milligrams of dust loaded into cotton, which is pretty interesting. For those astronauts or scientists that get dressed in a hurry, if you happen to put your shirt on inside out, you're at 50 milligrams. I don't know why the fabric is different inside out, but it has to do, we think, with the way that it can wick the dust away from the skin surface and pull it uh, so that you don't have direct physical contact. Penetrating, it's already within the space suit. And so to summarize, the, the very f small amount of data we've shown you um, is that the skin abrasion studies that Oregon Health and Sciences University are doing are very novel. They've des designed a system that's very simple to use um, and is providing some very interesting results. The first of which is that the lunar dust stimulant is highly abrasive. We didn't show you these results, but it's actually in the same range as commercial sandpaper and that the lunar dust experiments appear to be similar. Only a few milligrams of dust trapped between the spacesuit and the skin is enough to cause damage. Abrasion of the skin is dependent on the fabric type. And finally, that last bullet is, has very important implications for EVA suit design. If we can figure out in advance which fabrics are less abrasive, which fabrics pull the dust away, it would make excellent sense to have those in the inside of the spacesuit to help minimize the damage that's going to be occurring to the astronaut skin. In classical toxicology, typically the skin studies are done and then followed by the ocular studies. And so we're taking the same approach at Ames uh, with the ocular studies, so that component of the, the three focus areas of work uh, that the group is working on. This work has not yet started, but we are working together uh, with a couple of partners on base uh, to do the ocular studies. In particular, we're interested in uh, looking at the effect of lunar dusts on the cornea, the conjunctiva, and the sclera and iris of the eye. We want to know, if you get it in your eye, what effects will it have? Besides being exceptionally irritating. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other thing that we're curious about is What's the effect that washing will have on the eye? How much uh, wash does it take to get it out if you get it in there and so on? And some of you may be wondering, well, how would you get dust in your eye? Uh, aren't you suited up in the space suit when you're moving about on the surface of the moon doing an EVA? Any ideas how you might get it in your eye? Back in the module. Back in the module. <laughs> if, if you noticed on that first video, the dust sticked to every part of those spacesuits that it could possibly get in contact with. And that's one of the messages that we learned from the astronauts, that it sticks to everything and it is so easily dragged from the outside in, uh, lunar environment into the spacecraft itself. And so if there's a small amount of material that somehow gets dumped into the suit by accident uh, or by a simple uh, acceleration of the particles through movements inside the spacecraft, you might get it in your eye. We don't have a handle on the effects that it has, let alone the effects that it would have if it were chemically active. And there's also when we return to microgravity. So at some point we assume we're coming back to Earth and we're going to be in some sort of spacecraft that probably will be contaminated with dust. So how is that dust going to suddenly be floating around the habitat? Sorry. Um, and that it, it's, it's perfect to be floating around and to get in your eye as you're trying to function in your daily activities. I think it's for the... Yeah.
<laughs> we're loud, sorry about that. So the last area that we're interested in is probably the one that's, quote, the most logical for lunar dust. Most people think of this first and foremost, and that's the pulmonary toxicity. Um, as John introduced, we're doing the cellular components of this. Uh, we're supporting the work that's happening predominantly at Johnson. So we're working very closely with these guys to pull these experiments together. So dust in the lungs. Doesn't matter what kind of dust, it all has similar questions associated with it. But the ones that we're interested in, particularly for lunar dust, are how does the lung clear these weird shaped particles? Do they clear at all or are they stuck? Do you have effective clearance mechanisms? What is the effect of that highly reactive surface or the activated particles? And conversely, are the inactivated particles benign? Is it just the active surface that's of interest for toxicity or is it the particle itself? Is there a rate of passivation? And we're very interested in this. So if you have an active particle that comes in on a spacesuit, is it active for a minute, for 30 minutes, for 30 hours? And that will have huge ramifications for the engineering controls that need to be built in to deal with the dust. What is the effect of the 1,6G environment? What does this nanophase iron do? And how do we cause cellular injury? Is there a lot of cellular injury? Do we have the generation of reactive, reactive oxygen species or ROS? And ROS, okay, very important, because this is essentially the currency of damage within the lungs. If you have reactive oxygen species generation, initially that is the very beginnings of severe lung damage occurring. So let us remind you, of the 5% of lunar dust that's smaller than 5 microns, that is the fraction that we can breathe into the deep regions of the lungs. So what happens when we breathe it in? Perhaps, most likely, there will be damage to the lungs in the form of lung inflammation. What we know from Earth is fairly extensive, actually, in this field. Air pollution is known to irritate the airways in such a way that it leads to not only an increase in lung problems, but also heart problems, to the point where you don't want to be running today. Um, will lunar dust do the same thing to you? Also, silica. We have quite a bit of evidence with um, silica mining and the, the generation of fresh fractured silica. Will those, those reactive surface molecules, the silica found in lunar dust, can they cause these silica-based radicals that will lead to the production of a hydroxyl a uh, radicals and oxygen radicals? also which lead to the formation of hydrogen peroxide. Now, anything you use to disinfect your cuts is not something ideally you want forming in your lungs. So, how do we look at this? Here we have the lungs. There's a couple different approaches that we can look at what's happening. There's three cells that are of interest in this. One, two, and three. These are the macrophages. These are your white blood cells that patrol your lungs and pick up uh, dust, uh, bacterium, anything that's deposited on the air gas exchange surface. These are the guys that clean out your lungs. And they're also fantastic indicators of how the lung is responding to dust sedimentation. So, we went on a wee trip to West Virginia to NIOSH, um, which is part of the Center for Disease Control, where they do extensive studies of how Terrestrial dust damages the lungs. And we are trained there on how to look at, this is, this is uh, Mike, he's training us on how to look at the activation of these cells. And what we've done now is bring this technology back to Ames. We're working to set up these experiments um, and these should be starting essentially in early September. Our iCook protocol was just approved and we're making quite a bit of headway in this area. The other thing we're doing is a very simple um, lab test. And so here is the Lunar Dust Biotoxicity Laboratory that's located in uh, 239 at Ames. What we're doing in this lab is we're grinding minucil, which is a form of silica. So if you guys like to come check this out, this is the stuff we work with. Um, and then we expose it to a simple chemical terephthalate. And when this chemical comes into contact with a free radical on the surface, it becomes 2-hydroxyterephthalate, which is fluorescent. And so it's very simple for us to go and read these, the, fluorescent, the level of fluorescent in this solution to see how much, uh, how much hydroxyl radical is being formed. And 
This study was essentially pioneered and developed in this context by our colleagues at JSC, and I'd like to show you some of the really interesting preliminary results that Dr. William Wallace at NASA JSC has kindly shared with us. So here we have three samples. We have Apollo 16 lunar dust. We have lunar dust simulant, JSC-1A, VF. The VF is very fine, so the small stuff you can breathe in. And then Minusil 5, and the 5 refers to 5 microns, again, the fraction that you can breathe in. And so what you see is that this really high peak here is our Apollo 16 dust. And down here we have our simulant and our Minusil, which is of concern that they're so much lower, and yet on Earth we know they have such a high potential for toxicity. And this data was generated using that terephthalate assay that I just introduced you guys to. So chemical reactivity, very important. Now, ground. What does this ground business refer to? It has nothing to do with the ground that we walk on, but rather we have ground the lunar dust in an effect, in an attempt to reactivate the surface of it. Because of the way um, that the dust has been curated for the last 39 years, despite the best efforts, this dust has been exposed to oxygen and water in the atmosphere. And because of that, one of the most important features, the most interesting features, that of the chemical reactivity has been lost. So some of the stuff that we're attempting to do is rec re recreate that chemical reactivity. We're attempting to do that by grinding. We're attempting to do that by irradiation using proton or UV sources. Um, but we're trying to return that very interesting chemical reactivity perspective to the soil. So looking forward, we have a little bit to do. We have started the skin studies, but we still need to look at the skin irritation studies as well as the skin sensitization studies. Um, sensitization refers to the ability to develop an allergic response, as John has alluded to. And many of you don't think of a metal allergy, but Here's just a little fun note for all the women in the audience who've bought that cheap pair of earrings that makes your ear infected. That is an example of a nickel allergy. It's very prevalent in our population. A lot of us are exposed to it. So what in lunar dust may cause a similar response? Also, we really have a lot of work to do in the ocular studies. What will happen when it gets into the eye? Will it damage the cornea, the conjunctiva, the sclera, or the iris? All the superfici superficial features of the eye, but nonetheless, ones that are very important. And lastly, we're looking at the pulmonary toxicity. So the cellular studies, the intertracheal installation studies, as well as the in inhalation studies that will be done at JSC. And we want to know what is the particle size distribution and how does that affect toxicity? How does that nanophase iron come into play? And then lastly, what does that lunar dust chemical reactivity have to do with toxicity levels? And so we bring you back to this little problem the curation of the lunar dust. We are exceptionally fortunate to have at our disposal authentic lunar dust that we can use, and yet we can't replicate one of the most interesting features of the lunar dust, and that's the chemical reactivity. So we have a plan. So the approach that we're going to take with Lunachem uh, is to measure the chemical reactivity of lunar dust in situ. What we want to do is tie the work that we're doing here at Ames to a real mission. We're developing a small payload that's going to be part of a lander that will land on the surface of the moon to do the first wet chemistry on the surface of the moon to apply the knowledge about the terephthalate assay uh, on the moon. And so we have brought with us today a conceptual design, uh, sort of a slide-by-slide -slide animation of the first draft of an idea for how we'd actually do this uh, in terms of measuring the chemical reactivity, incorporating the terephthalate assay, and also the, the techniques for uh, accessing the sample, saving it to the, the type of material that you want to be working with, and then sending the data back to Earth. There's also the important component that this payload addresses, which is the passivation. So how long does it take that reactivity to be lost? So first, we're going to identify the level of reactivity compared to terrestrial reference materials. And then the multiple wells you see are shortened, the little green rack at the bottom. I think your laser pointer's died. Oh, there it is. Um, that's to convey that we'll have multiple time points that progress <coughs> out to a 48-hour time point so we can see how the dust activity fades over time in a lunar environment. So the idea here is to send up the payload unpressurized and it's in a normal vacuum spaceflight environment. And 
of ultimately to expose those samples in an ambient-like condition. So we want to see that passivation effect as if it were inside a spacecraft. So the first steps in this is to actually get a sample of real lunar dust. The arm moves down, grabs a sample of dust, and places it into a small sieving device, which then distributes the samples very small quantities. We're talking milligram-sized uh, amounts here. The total sample acquisition is one gram. To the sample wells of the rack. Once the rack moves then into the region of the data acquisition part of the hardware, this little door closes and we then pressurize the system to mimic the temperature, humidity, and pressure that we expect to be inside spacecraft. Go ahead. Okay. And at this point, we add reagent. The experiment uses only one simple reagent, it is the terephthalate. And we add that, allow some time to pass, as Aaron has mentioned, uh, from sample well to sample well, irradiate the sample with a, uh, an LED, and measure the fluorescence of that sample after uh, the irradiation. We do that to all the wells, and the idea then also is to put in the sample rack, control samples from Earth, which include lunar dust simulants, probably minocell, and potentially even a real sample of lunar dust that has been brought back from the Apollo mission. So we're trying to control for all of the different possible areas of question here. So the real thing about this payload is that we are doing so much research here on Earth with, as John just alluded to, the simulant, the minucil, and the real lunar dust. And yet we don't know how those things compare to the lunar dust in its pristine environment. So we need, we, we need to understand how those compare. So that's why we are potentially considering sending real lunar dust back to the moon, which seems a bit odd when you think about it at first. But it will give us a ratio. It will give us an understanding of how all the research we've done to date actually will translate into the real situation on the lunar surface. And so, a lot of this work, to conclude, has, has involved many different people. This list is less than extensive, but it's, it includes a few. David Loftus, also known as our fearless leader. Russell Kirschman, uh, we have had the pleasure of having a summer intern join us, Clara. William Wallace is the gentleman who we are doing a lot of work with at JSC. He's the one that's perfected the terephthalate assay, and we're doing cell studies with him now. Larry Taylor and David McKay are fabulous. They're always willing to answer our questions and help us with the geology understanding of the lunar dust, which is a bit daunting when you start it. And Kim Coleman, who has been working with Raman spectroscopy and some of the activation studies, and we will be also working with her in the future. NIOSH was kind enough to host us for a week and train us and is, is still always willing to work with us and, and work on our protocol development. They've been fabulous. Oregon Health and Sciences University is doing the amazing abrasion work with the skin and NASA headquarters for giving us monies. And so we leave you with this lovely photograph and wish you to have a very nice dusty day. Well, from my air pollution background, we are just beginning to understand what the air we breathe here on Earth is doing to us. And it's been 25, 30 years in understanding that. So you translate that into, we have 382 kilograms of lunar dust, most of which is too big for us actually to study in this context. We are doing the best we can with it, but it, it, the fact remains there will be a lot of questions left. Now as to what the astronauts will have to do, mitigate would be my cheeky answer. Um, in what format? I don't know. It will really depend. There's a lot of very interesting variables. Some of it may come down to our site selection, where we go. I didn't allude to this, but the nanophase iron confers a magnetic property to the lunar dust. So that might be one of our best friends in terms of being able to pull that out of the habitat.
to be able to screen it out of the air. Perhaps there will be a lot of changing of filters, things of that nature. But essentially, we, in our current state, we don't think you can breathe this stuff at a high frequency, at a high loading, without there being some fairly significant health consequences. tolerated. It was not uh, mitigated. They knew it was there and then realized the problem of it and so they just simply dealt with it. Uh, so potentially they're going to have to develop engineering controls, uh, mitigation strategies and a variety of, of potential operational uh, scenarios that will have to be implemented into operations to limit the effects. We don't know. One more thought and then I'll be quiet. To add to that, we just talked about biology. What about the wear and tear in the surface habitat, to the spacesuit, to the solar panels, to the, you name it, everything. The dust is a problem. So the question for the people that couldn't hear that was the astronaut effects and what happened to them. Um, there were incidental reports of of the dust getting into the eyes. The ocular work that we are starting to work on is of particular interest to the astronauts just because of a comfort level. Um, there wasn't a lot of inhalation problems. Some of them re reported slight inflammation of the airways, so you sort of mild symptoms of a cold, congestion. Yeah, some reported that the dust smelt like gunpowder and we're not we don't fully understand why that is. It may have been that when the dust came into the habitat, there's some sort of chemical reaction that's taken place that's caused that smell to permeate. There also was one inhalation event that happened after the suits were brought back in the curation facilities where one worker actually had to stop work because of uh, the accidental inhalation of some of the material. Yeah, he picked up the spacesuit and as a consequence was hospitalized. Excellent question. I don't know. That's one of the yep. Absolutely. Those are some of the anticipated ground studies that will need to be performed. We've started initially just a few tests to look at the, the effects that time may have on terephthalates' ability to fluoresce. So we, we've started some of those assays. It appears to be able to, at room temperature in the lab, uh, we made a solution three months ago that was just as reactive as a solution that was made days, like days ago, but tested immediately. So it seems to be fairly stable in those lovely conditions, but what the, the low pressure, the cold temperatures will do will be, it, it'll, it'll happen. Very interesting. Um, I happened yesterday to be seeing a presentation of at least a notional plan for the lunar base. And of course, they're going to make those decisions on, on the technology long before 2020. And that had the, uh, the space suit never coming inside the habitat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, but, uh, Yes and no, but you have a spacesuit, I agree, and that would be a huge help, but you have a spacesuit that has been running around on the lunar surface. Inevitably, you're going to have to do maintenance on it, and where would you do it? On the lunar surface, or would you bring it inside the habitat? It would be a great way of minimizing it, and I think it's a step completely in the right direction, but I don't know if there is a way that we can always keep those suits outside. Awesome. Bring it on. Yep. Uh, if we can keep it out of the habitat, that solves the problem. But first, we do need to know how much is too much. And so that's what we're after. But the, if we can use some material engineering to, to try and reduce the sticky factor, that would be great. Be very useful. Kevin?
Asbestos particles are long and skinny and very different than lunar dust. It is, it is frequently likened to lunar dust mostly because it is nasty. And we think lunar dust is nasty. But in terms of the physical appearance of the two, they're very bit different beasts. And the way that the, the lung pathology manifests with asbestos is very different than it does in a silicon-based reaction. So uh, asbestos essentially irritates the lung to the point where it responds and starts to produce fibrosis. It's a different response. So the, the, that, that is a very simple, that is a very common uh, thing that I myself did initially when I started studying lunar dust, but it tends to be slightly incorrect. One of the interesting points that I'll just briefly mention as a side is that there have been some biological uh, experiments performed with real lunar dust in a pulmonary sense. The Russians did some of this work uh, in the 80s as well as possibly in the 70s from some of the min uh, samples that had been returned from the lunar missions. So we have uh, done literature research that shows that there is demonstrated evidence that in their research that lunar dust possibly could cause a fibrogenic response in the lungs. So there is evidence in the literature that already shows this. However, for some reason, no one talks about those Russian studies, and we haven't figured out why yet. We're trying to get those papers translated before we draw our own conclusions. In the back? In terms of blistering and the wear and tear, do you mean like just physical blisters from walking too much? You know, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that question. I would presume yes, but that could be wrong. But what I do know is that the currently on the ISS, there's a lot of work that's done to try and mitigate the damage of the of the EVA suits to the astronauts. They cause wearing to the point where you have huge red spots where some of the packs rub. Um, it's very common for the astronauts to lose their fingernails because of the way that the gloves are designed. And so constantly pushing against the surface with your fingers and there's that constant impact. So there is definite evidence of damage to the astronauts in a superficial way from those suits. Um, and now let's just throw some <coughs> abrasive of lunar dust in there and see how fabulous that situation becomes. So Remind ourselves that those EVAs were a fairly short duration. On the lunar surface. The Apollo or the ISS ones obviously are much longer. We do have evidence for some defects that exist in the lunar material to which under UV irrigation would generate these ROS, these extremely oxidizing surface particles. I was just thinking that maybe when you bring these dust particles from the vacuum of the lunar surface into the environment, one could think about ideas how to deactivate these surface particles. And that would be maybe another excellent mitigation approach. approach. Absolutely. We think that one of the fastest and the easiest ways of mitigating it in terms of silica is getting it wet. That's However, the that we use to dispose of activated hydrogen peroxide, which would decompose and get rid of the reactive species. Exactly, but on a lunar base, nobody is going to be designing in water showers, so that idea unfortunately must go away. At least in the early stages. In the early stages. We gave you guys time. You don't have any more questions? So we're working with uh, a company called Macusite, and they've done quite a bit of pharmaceutical testing in terms of the eye. We're going to follow a similar protocol that they're working with. Um, essentially, it's just a simple exposure and then evaluation of the response and the irritation response to the eye. And, uh, and the irritation response in terms of what? Tearing, redness. So just basically physical. Physical. Yeah. yeah. And we don't, because of the highly unkind nature of such a study. We're not doing a lot of them. We're keeping the, the ends very small. And what we're doing is immediately, in most cases, washing to try and get the dust out and see more so how much of a wash needs to occur and how we can counteract the side effects. There's been a number of experiments, as you may know, at Ames that have done ocular studies 10 years or so worth of work in, in rabbits. So that the rabbit will be the model for those studies. So we'll be stemming from that legacy. So you're not scientific?
Well, we will in time, but it, what we're hoping to do is see if we can do a recovery process and see if there's actual long-term damage as opposed to um, chronic irritation. We will. Right now, we've been working with the simulants. In order to get the real lunar dust, you need to prove you know what you're doing, which is logical. So we're working with the simulants in order to get, um, in order to get uh, practice, if you will, and to establish a baseline for what we can compare to NIOSH's work and work that's done here. And then we will do a very small sample number of actual lunar dust exposures. The approach is to use the minicel first then use the lunar simulant and then use the real lunar dust. Now obviously you can't ask for red how it's feeling, so how are you going to judge that damage? So we look at those macrophages that lurk in the lungs. And those macrophages are essentially the window into the inflammatory response of the body. So when they are upset, they become reactive, they release cytokines. You can look for indicators of that cytokine response within the lung very easily. It's a simple washing of the lung to take out those cells and then to do analysis on them. At the back. You very well could. You essentially could chew off slivers in the habitat of the, the habitat materials. I'm not sure. That would be a great experiment to see if, the, if, the, if they've been looking into that. We've been doing the biological stuff, but it's an excellent line of thought. In, 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 in the sad reality, in many cases, it's not mitigated properly. Um, you can try and keep the ventilation low. You can try and prevent scenarios where you have the fresh fracturing because that's what's ultimately dangerous. The fresh fractured particles lead to mortalities in the time frames of months as opposed to decades. And so there's a huge difference there. Um, and then there's just also an exposure maximum. We know how much we can be exposed to. So if you keep those air pollution levels or the dust levels in the mines but close to that, and you limit a person's time to that, your lungs are amazing. They can clean out a lot of crud, as any smoker, bad smokers, should know. <laughs> so, um, in for the larger particles, yes. But the scary thing is, the little guys are the dangerous ones. The little ones are the hardest ones to take out. So my particular favorite is the people that wear those masks. No, don't do a damn thing. You can find entry points. Yeah, especially the masks that don't stick to the side of the face. Those are really good ones. Don't don't buy them. They no, they have really little point. They'll keep straw. <laughs> <laughs> At the back. Awesome question. When the terminator passes, how does it modify the charge? N no, but yes, w there's a lot of questions associated with that. This lofting, which I won't even bring up the dust lofting issue because I'll show you there'll be a fight. But y you wonder if that lofting is particularly prevalent when the terminator crosses and you get the flipping of the charge. That also may have huge biological consequences. The challenge we face is that at no point was that chemical reactivity ever quantified. So trying to mimic something you don't actually know proves to be particularly challenging. So we're working on it. But this is why Lunachem needs to fly. Absolutely. I use the analogy that we have 
you know, there are nine sample sites, but really six that we're drawing from for acquiring lunar dust. And from this, we are basing all of our analysis of what the lunar dust composition and characteristics are like. So that would sort of be like saying that all the dirt in mm, Oregon, Washington, California, that's what it's like all around the world which we sort of know is not particularly the case. There's a lot of people that say that the whole lunar surface is magnetic, all the lunar dust is magnetic, but how do we know that? It's, it's a big thing to rely upon for mitigation strategies because you don't want to be the nincompoop that designed that in only to find out that the whole habitat is in trouble because it isn't magnetic. In a perfect world, we'd want to be able to sample the, the dust in the assumed landing site and then characterize uh, the material in a biological and toxolo toxicological sense. As well as engineering. It, it should, but not completely. And those are big assumptions to make. Big assumptions, I think, to make. I would rather, if we can figure that out for sure before we design a whole habitat around it, I think that might be a good idea. Yeah, we didn't allude to that, but when we did the skin abrasion work, we actually compared the highland and the mare, and there were differences at first glance. So in terms of skin abrasion, it may also be the same for pulmonary toxicity and ocular effects. In the back? The nanophase iron, yep. Yes, uh, to a point. So our colleague Larry Taylor is, if you guys have any familiarity with lunar geology, you've heard his name quite a few times before. He is in the process of attempting to take JSC1A and impregnate within it the, the nanophase iron. So you can do exactly those types of studies. He's done some preliminary work with the real lunar dust. He has an idea of how to mimic it, and he's trying to replicate it in, in hopes of doing exactly what you're suggesting. Thoughts? Agreed. Okay.